Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. I am Joe Sebelia. Please make sure you follow the channel here on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button so you can be notified anytime we post a new video. If you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, please make sure you subscribe wherever you are listening. This week's guest is part of Rock Royalty. He has played with the likes of Ozzy Osbourne, Quiet Riot, White Snake, Dio, The Guess Who, Blue Oyster Cult, and so many more. My guest, bassist Rudy Sarzo. It's the rock and roll and rock and show. Yeah, we do. So when you're growing up in Cuba, I mean, were you playing instruments at that time? Or was that not until you got over to the States when you started? I was 10, 10 years old. And by 1959, uh, when I was nine, uh, it was pretty, we were pretty much in survival mode, mm -hmm. you know, making the transfer from, uh, from, you know, the, 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 the government that was pre-Castro to what became uh, communism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so it was like, uh, yeah, I, I love music and there was music all over the place, but it was not like. I think have any real plans about with music because you know you have to like learn it you have to sure. you know spend time with, with with the craft yeah and I just didn't have that because we were basically preparing to leave the country mm -hmm. and because you know we we had to get passports we have to get visas we have to have somebody claim us from the United States we have to buy tickets and this wow. is all undercover right because right. uh nobody you know yeah you know you have to basically you were escaping basically nobody in my family outside of our my my brother my mom and dad knew what was going on the plans that we had wow. about leaving the country so uh yeah we just left our apartment in havana like we were going out for a holiday on the weekend because oh, wow. you were not allowed to bring out anything with you you know when you left the country anyway so mm -hmm. we just we just uh, got some duffel bags and stuffed some clothes in it and and got, got out of there and once you got over to the states or or was it a pretty smooth did your parents make it a pretty smooth transition for you well i mean my 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 parents can only do so much because, right because you know i'm dealing i'm dealing with society mm -hmm. yeah. yeah society yeah. <laughs> for a kid you know i mean and i'm talking about society within within the parameters of being in school. Mm -hmm. That was my social contact outside of my family, you know? And, you know, you have the language barrier and then you have the cultural barrier and then you are, you're seen as a, as a, as a, an alien, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. not, a, not born there. You know, I'm talking 1961, you know. So eventually what happened is by 1963, after being in Miami for a couple of years and, and an influx of more Cubans started coming in, not like it's happening now at, at, the, uh, at the border, the south border, mm -hmm. because we have flights. You can't walk from Cuba <laughs> to the United <laughs> States. Right, right. right. So you, the, you, you're depending on flights and then later on, there will be boats, but it was, it was flights at the time, you know. So we had the flights, and only there was only so many flights a day. So let's say you had, let's say, a hundred people in each flight, a couple of flights a day. That's two hundred people a day, uh, a day coming in, and it adds up, you know. And these people, we had, you know, we had sponsors, and we had to get on the, on the plane with uh, with a visa and a passport. And the only way to get a visa is if you had somebody claiming you from the United States. So it wasn't like we were just showing up and going hey we're here you know you know yeah. we, we had a place to go to and you know things to be assimilated into the growing slowly growing cuban community of, of in miami that it is what it is today you know i see I sitting see. 60 years later you know <laughs> uh but uh but so what happened was there's not enough jobs to sustain the influx of people coming in so they um uh, they offer us, my family, the relocation program. So we were relocated. They gave us choices of different cities in the United States. My parents picked uh, um, Union City, New Jersey. And once we got to New Jersey, it was Union City, Newark area. 
we lived in the projects for a little while. And then my family decided, hey, let's go to West New York. And that's where we actually, you know, uh, made our, our home. We got an apartment, West New York. I went to public school number five and Memorial wow. High. And my brother went to public school number five, too, and, and so on. So, you know, here, here we are. And what was really interesting is that I, and I had never experienced this before because Havana was pretty multicultural, you know. And yes, of course, there were different neighborhoods, you know, like the Jewish neighborhood and, and the Italian neighborhood, Chinese, Chinese, especially neighborhood, you know, Chinatown mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but as far as the ethnic ethnicities, you know, everybody mingled, co-mingled, lived, you know, it wasn't like they were like separate. Uh, but when I got to New Jersey, I found that there were all these neighborhoods, you know, Germans neighborhood, Irish, Italians, right. Jewish, black, very little Lat Latinos at the time. Uh, the Latinos were mostly in the Bronx but not mm -hmm. in New Jersey and West New York, you know. So, you know, my first uh, year of school, I got there, let's say, 63, the first half. It was, it was a little bit awkward, you know, uh, especially still a lot of language barrier. Uh, but one thing that I discovered was that the, the different ethnicities would stick with each other. Mm -hmm. Like the Irish and the Italians, they were all only stick, you know, be with each other, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Beatles happened, oh. and and music became the common denominator. Yeah, everybody started to like hang out with each other. If you were like into the Beatles, if you go, what wait, we pre the day before the Beatles play on Ed Sullivan show, we all comb our hair, you know, back like a pompadour. The next right. day, we're all getting you know combing <laughs> our bangs down you know so uh that that's what really brought everybody together okay you know, culturally you know at of in, in school and then it just transferred beyond that you know i think society really try opening up and there were a lot of changes going on people mm -hmm. really looking at each other quite differently because now we have so much in common so was the beatles is that what got you into the rock and roll yeah i mean when i first saw them i i i wanted what they had which was uh, girls screaming at them right right what what you know i was a chubby little <laughs> i was i was a chubby big 13 year old were you right. and uh, oh yeah yeah well <laughs> We were eating a lot of uh, government cheese at the time and, <laughs> and, and army surplus food. Yeah. You know, that's, that's how we, uh, one of the uh, assistance that we got from, from the government was the uh, army surplus food, especially in Miami. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a lot of bulky food, you know, with yeah. a lot of preservatives and stuff. Government cheese spam was one of them. <laughs> oh, geez. Powder milk and powder eggs and, you know, things like that. Yes. Man, man. Yeah. Back in Miami is where you first met Frankie, correct? Uh, yeah, but I came back from Jersey. Okay, so you Miami. went back to Miami. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. My yeah, my family, uh, my mom and dad could only put up with for like three years of uh, snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. coming from the Caribbean. That, that's yeah, you, didn't, you don't get much snow down there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not lately. Yeah, but then, then there's climate change, you know. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> so, so tell me about know. tell me about that first time you met Frankie. Yeah, it was November eighteenth, nineteen seventy two. I had I had been to the local kind of like a it was kind of like an amusement park slash uh, rock venue, mm -hmm. which was called Pirates World. It had a shed. Sounds like a theme park. It's a theme park, theme park, and 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 a shed right right <laughs> attached to it, you know. Okay. And uh, in Hollywood, or Dania, Dania, Florida, uh, very near to Fort Lauderdale, and uh, so I went to see Bowie, Spires from Mars tour. The uh, that was the only American tour they did. Oh really? I didn't that know year, nineteen seventy two. Yeah, seventy two. Yeah, and uh, so. 
I walk in and there's this band, opening band playing, and I'm getting blown away. I'm going like, wow, these guys are incredible. But, but that drummer, that drummer is unbelievable. I had no idea who they were. If they were from, you know, Chicago or, you know, I didn't know they were local. Mm. And uh, so, you know, I, the next day I go to the, it's my birthday the next day. So I saw him uh, perform on the 17th of November, 1972. Next day, my birthday, the 18th, I'm hanging out at the local rock hangout in Philodeville. It's called the Flying Machine. And somebody I'm talking to, and they go, hey, that's one of the guys from the band that opened up for Bowie last night. And I go, so I just like run over and introduce myself. And I go, hi, my name is Rudy. I saw you guys playing last night opening for Bowie. I thought you guys were fantastic. And I'm like raving you know, about the band. And then I start raving about the drummer. <laughs> and this guy's looking at me, shaking his head, uh huh, uh huh. And then, and then when I stop, he goes, Oh, my name is Frankie. I'm the drummer. I thought I was talking to the bass player. Oh, uh, geez. You know, you know I was in the nosebleed seats. You know, yeah, yeah, back, it's a little hard you know. to see. Yeah, very hard. <laughs> and uh, so immediately, you know, we just, we started hanging and playing. So we, we started playing 50 years ago this year. That's amazing. 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were in bands. We, you know, we, we, we left Florida together. We, we, uh, we toured in the Chicago area. We were based out of there. Then we decided, well, it's time to go to LA. And we did that in 77. 77. Okay. So you 77. both went out to LA. Yeah. Okay. And then... Yeah. Once you got out to LA, I mean, did you guys stay together out there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We were living together. Okay. Of Melrose and Sweetser in an okay. apartment. Yeah, yeah. We were living with uh with the band. It was the the whole band. And uh, let's see, uh, our singer. Her name is uh, Tony Childs. Tony Childs. He said she won a Grammy few years ago when she went solo and stuff like that uh -huh. and our keyboard player's name is bob marlett he's a very well-known producer he was our keyboard player and guitar player you know we're what still band? in touch with what yeah. band was this well we only did one show at the starwood oh. called scarab scarab that, okay scarab okay. yeah one show scarab, and what, yeah. what happened well there weren't that many play you know we were very choosy very picky we really wanted to be ready uh you know when we actually did decide okay we're ready to play you mm -hmm. know and uh, we did a lot of rehearsals we did a lot of demos you know we we had a uh just like everybody going to la it was not about playing a bunch of club dates it was more about getting your original material getting it recorded trying to get some interest from managers and you know find the cracks in the, in the mm -hmm. big wall you know walls of behind the music industry how to get in there mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. almost like let me tell you what it really reminds me of it reminds me of the wizard of oz you know once you uh, rip that curtain yeah but that curtain while that curtain is there you don't know you you start imagining oh this is this is this huge machine with all these people and they're like you know right. they make decisions and control your life and everything and the best thing that ever happened with technology, you know, the way that ba the bands manage themselves, they do everything on their own. They record themselves, they produce themselves. I mean, it has its pros and cons. I can spend hours talking about this, but the bottom line is it's a very level playing field. You could be a Billie Eilish in your bedroom, making music, put it up on YouTube and there you go. Boom, yeah. You don't have to like depend on a artist relation or finding a producer or somebody to give you spec time recording in a studio. Uh, not, none of that, doing a bunch of showcases for managers and, and no, you just make, it, make your art, show it to the world. And if it's good, it's gonna resonate with the masses. Right. And that's it, very right. simple, you know? Okay. And then, so in 77, is that when you first met Kevin when you got out there also? Yeah. Around that time? Yeah. Yeah, it was, and it was basically the, the same thing. As a matter of fact, I was talking with uh, Dana Strum, the uh, the bass player for uh, for Slaughter. Right. And and when I first saw uh, 
Quiet Riot it was at the Starwood. And I walk in and there's a, a, a band playing before them. It was Dana's band oh, okay. uh, called uh, Bad Axe. But we were talking about it the other day because we, uh, Slaughter and Quiet Riot, did, did a show together. And uh, so we were on the same flight going into to, to the gig. And we we're talking about it. He's giving me his, his perception of that night. He uh -huh. was the, in the opening band and he actually saw uh, Randy perform and he was compelled to go to the dressing room to tell Randy that he was better than the situation that he was in. You <laughs> that know? Randy was better than, than yeah, that uh, what you're doing is not as good as who I you see. are. Yeah, wow. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Now, meanwhile, you know, on, on, on my story, my perception is I, I saw quite a riot and I went, wow, these guys have it together. They're actually a, a uh, arena band, you know, perception, yeah. consciousness, performing in a club these guys got it together and one thing i must add by then i have been around the country playing in clubs you know for about three about three years in okay. addition to what i was doing in florida i'm talking about really getting out there outside of florida sure and so i've seen a lot and i you know i was stationed out of chicago you know that was that's where the band shatterstar we were based out of we, you know, everybody, <clears throat> uh, you know, there was a lot of great local bands at the time in 1976, 77, you know, out of Chicago. So it was like, it's not like, uh, you know, like I was hiding somewhere, you know, right. not experiencing what's out there. And I went and I went to LA, so quiet, right? And I said, wow, of all the bands that I've been watching for the last few years playing clubs, you guys, you guys really got it together, you know? So that's basically, you know, I saw the band, <clears throat> Kevin gets off the stage and he's wandering around the club. I bump into him and I go, I, again, I introduce myself just like I did to Frank. To Frank. <laughs> but this time, but this time I knew that Kevin was the singer in the band, you know, not another <laughs> member, you know? Not and I, and I tell him, yeah, not the bass player. And I say, <laughs> hey man, I mean, if we were running to the bass player, I would have said the same thing. Yeah. But it just happens to be, it was Kevin. I said, hey, man, you know, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and um, I just got into town. I've been watching all these bands all over the country, and you guys are an arena band playing in a club. Keep doing what you're doing. You guys are going to be huge someday. And that was it. I just I just walked away. Yeah. You wow. know, you know, you know, and uh, that's how I met Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, um, so... So what happened with, like, you and Frankie split off, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We split up. But every time we split, I mean, at that time, I was still playing with Frankie in 77. Uh-huh. You know, and uh, when, when, I, when I made uh, Kevin, you know. And uh, as a matter of fact, when, when Choir Riot broke up, I, I joined in 78 the following year. Okay, so Frankie and I were playing in 77. In LA, that band broke up. We ran out of money. I needed to get some money. My brother offered to uh, to have me come out to Jersey to uh, to play some clubs with him. I got right. some money together from that. Went back to LA. I went back to LA three times because I I, I kept running out of money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I would go out <laughs> to do gigs and go then, make then some come money. back. Yeah, yeah, go make some money and, and come back again. You know, give give it another shot. And on that last one in '78. That's when I, uh, I auditioned for Choir Riot, got the gig, and started playing with them up until 1979 when Randy left the band to join Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. You were talking about that in your book, because your, your book, um, Off the Rails, talks yeah. about um, pretty much your Randy time, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got that book right here. I haven't finished reading oh. it, though, but... Thank, thank you for reading it. Yeah. Thank you. Got thank the paperback. You. I really wanted the hardback, but you know, uh, there's hard... no hardback. I know. Yeah, so yeah. I had to get the there's paperback. There's no hardback. But... Yeah. Yeah. Also came with an autographed poster. If you signed those. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So your tryout with Quiet Riot, um, you, I, I, you said it in your book about killer girls or something. You were playing in the wrong. Team. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was kind of amusing. So you go out there yeah. and you're playing the song. 
Well, what happened is they send me a tape and, you know, tape is, is, is you know, uh, a lot of machines are not aligned. It's not, it, it, the technology yeah. 45 years ago was not what we have today. Everything is locked in. Uh, I would have gotten an MP3 five years ago. <laughs> right, right. I mean, 45 years ago. Yeah, you know, yeah. I would have not gotten an MP3, but now I would have gotten an MP3. And, but back then it was kind of like, I, I listened to the tape, you know, actually reel to reel. I put it on and I go, oh, it sounds like they're playing an F. It can't be. That, that's really an E riff. Yeah. But no, it was actually an F riff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? It does sound like an E. I was listening to it online yeah. and yeah, I can yeah. see where you made that mistake. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 you know, right on the spot, I transposed it back back to F and, you know, just carry on with the, uh, with, with the audition. Yeah. And then you got the gig. Got the gig. And then. Yeah, um, they, they were looking for, most of the bass players in LA were pick players and they were looking more for somebody with uh, like a, uh, you know, their favorite bands, the consciousness of the band at the time, it's always has been uh, Queen, Humble Pie, Glam Rock, you know, Bowie, all mm -hmm, of that. Mm -hmm. And th those are finger play from Trevor Boulder to, to John Deacon to Greg Ridley and all those guys, you know, they were finger players. And so every time they audition somebody it was more like a pick player. And mm -hmm. that's not what they were, the sound or the feel that they were looking for. So okay. I, I have been playing with my fingers. As a matter of fact, up until then, I had just um, solely playing, playing with my fingers and no pick. Now I play with both, not live, but for recording purposes. Okay, yeah, I, I was going to ask if you were a pick or strictly finger yeah. player because I don't recall ever yeah. seeing you with a pick much. Yeah, I got I got my own my own line of picks right here. There you that's go. That's a, that's a little Is picture that, of me. That's right you. Now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah, and I got. You know, what's interesting about picks is like, you know, there's my little, one of my balls of picks Yeah, is that, you know, I'll take like a, like, let's say, according to the gauge, according to the feel of the song, if, if it's really fast, I want a tighter, tighter mm -hmm. pick, you know, thicker pick. So I, I, I know where my thicker ones are. If it's, if it's a looser feel, then I want a thinner pick more of almost like a guitar pick. You know, mm -hmm. and according to the way that you hold it, or 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 even the tone of the pick, you know the uh, the material, mm -hmm. you're gonna get di different sounds. It's just like your finger, you know. You you give your instrument to ten different people, and because the hands are such, sure. it's gonna sound different, different because the sound is in your hand, the sound is in your pick, also. Okay. Okay. Hey, I got to ask. So you joined Quiet Riot when they had, they already had a successful album in Japan, correct? I don't know how successful it was. I never got figures, but they, they had a two record deal in Japan. Right. right. Only, only in Japan. As far as the United States, they, 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 they that those records did not exist. Right. And you came in yeah. at the, yeah. you didn't play on the second one, but you came in, no. you came in at that time, correct? Yes, I came in when the record was mixed and they were ready to do a photo shoot. Oh, for, and I got to ask the you. Album cover, for the album cover. What is with that album cover, by the way? Why, why the football locker room? I had just joined the band. I never asked. <laughs> okay. I just show up at this place and <laughs> I did. There were some guys there. They were gay. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, all right. Let's just okay. do this. I just joined the band. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was gonna be that guy that, that come up with all these <laughs> questions, you know, like, you know. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, okay. whatever. Yeah. So then how long how long were you guys playing uh as quiet right before Randy left for Ozzy? Uh well, I was in the I joined uh, uh my first show. I actually I joined the band about a couple of months before that and then they were going through certain preparation shows, such as the record and blah, 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 blah. So October 4th was my first show mm -hmm. that weekend. I think, uh, yeah, four, five, and six okay. of, uh, uh, of 1978. By 79, Randy left the band. Okay. Uh, November, the end of November. No, the, I'm sorry, the end of October. Kevin's okay. birthday is uh, the 29th. So um that was the last show we did at this that was it live so when and, he left uh, that was, you you guys were done for at that moment we were yeah choir riot ceased to exist 
and I put together a band with Frankie and it, we, you know, it didn't, it, it didn't do anything because it was basically hard rock guys trying to play new wave music. Mm. We cut our hair in, shorter. Right? I did. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. That was it. I mean, if you don't play this, you're not going to eat. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. So I said, okay, I got to eat. <laughs> and, and the clock is ticking. You know, I'm getting older. And, uh, but it, it just took that band to say, no, no, this is, is I, 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 you know, it's not me. Mm. You know, I'm not, I'm not a new wave dude. I, I love new wave music, you know, but it's not who, it's not who I am. Uh -huh. I love music. I'm a musician, but you have to know, you know, it's like, you know, it's like vegetables, you know, I'm, I'm sure that all the vegetables get along together, <laughs> but a broccoli has to know, Hey, I'm a broccoli. <laughs> yeah. I, so yeah you're I right. am. I, I am broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> all right, broccoli. <laughs> um, all right. So, and then, so Randy goes off with Ozzy and then he yeah. brings you in a little bit later. Yeah. Also what happened was that, uh, that Kevin, uh, he kept playing and he called his band Dubro. Right. Because at that time, you know, everybody was in survival mode and, you know, just like it is a, a lot nowadays, that people have multiple bands because we can only, you know, I mean, unless you're in a legacy band, like, uh, like quiet riot or, or some of the other bands from the eighties, uh, you know, just because we're not depending on, on current music mm -hmm. because even if we did, very few people would buy or, or even be aware of, 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 of the new music. Because yeah. I mean, they want to, they want to hear yeah. the hits of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's why they're legacy bands. But, uh, but uh, you know, unless you're in one of those bands, you're going to be in different bands uh, for so you can play as much as you can and, and, and make a living from it. You know, so mm -hmm. back then, back in 1979, that was, again, pretty much the scene in, in L.A., unless you wanted to have a day job that would get in the way of you, you know, your musical career. Mm -hmm. I had day jobs. I did. And I make sure that they were wise decisions, such as. Uh, working in a in a restaurant mm. that way you you be guaranteed you were going to eat <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> if you're Not a starving musician work in a restaurant yeah yeah that's a, a good restaurant tip. second choice a clothing store so you can always look good so you can find a girl that will buy you help food. you eat <laughs> that's right you know? and then you, you have know. a place to live it all it all that's works right. out yeah it all works out yeah yeah but they, you have to have a strategy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right so, so 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 i i started playing with kevin i was playing with him in the band of bro as a matter of fact most of the material that wound up on metal health uh was from the dubrow period right you know okay. uh, at least a little bit over a half at least a half or a little bit over. And uh, so I, I, I left Dubro and I was living with Kevin when I got the gig to, uh, to join Ozzy. So when that happened, I mean, did Kevin, I mean, how did he take that? Because then Randy's off with that, uh, Ozzy. Now you're off with Ozzy. I mean, what did he say when you told him you were going? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I, I also, at that time, I was playing with a band called Angel. Mm -hmm. And they didn't didn't have the record deal anymore, so they were looking for a record deal. And then I'm playing locally with uh, with in Dubrow and living with Kevin. You know that way I could pay I could pay the rent. And uh, so I get the call to audition, and it's Sharon. I mean, they, they Sharon calls Kevin's home. Uh, home. He says, "Rudy, there's a call for you." I get the phone. It happens to be Sharon, and telling me, "Hey, Randy's been telling me." about you and we would like to for you to come down and audition for Ozzy and I did something that I don't do anymore I immediately said oh no thank you I am I'm, I'm playing this band called Angel and blah 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 and she hangs up with me and that was it so so Kevin goes uh, who was that and I go oh I explained to him and he starts yelling at me <laughs> for being so stupid to awesome. turn down the opportunity to yeah. uh, to play with Randy and and to get off the floor because I was sleeping on his floor on his mm. sheet. You know, it was plush uh, carpeting at the time, you know, very popular in the 70s. You know, <laughs> shag, shag carpeting. Comfortable. You know? Very shaggy. 
<laughs> it was very shaggy. It was very shaggy. And uh, so the next day, I, I, I get another call. I, I had no idea that it was gonna, I was going to get another call. And it happens to be uh, Ozzy. And he says, hey, man, you know, we, we auditioned a bunch of guys. There are a bunch of hacks. And uh, Randy keeps telling me that you're the guy. And I, and he says, uh, would you like to come down? And I go, yes. <laughs> it changed just like that. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that, that evening, I actually, uh, Randy picked me up and took me over to the hotel where Ozzy was staying at. And we have some food. We talked. And the next day, I auditioned and got the gig. And after I got the Apache audition, they took me up to where Sharon and Ozzy were living. Oh, well, it's actually Sharon's family estate up in up in the uh, Benedict Canyon, hmm. and and I, I and I stayed with them ever since. Uh, I was living with them all that time. Yeah, you know, at the house, and then we would get off the road in breaks, and I would still go back to the house and stay there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. they treated me uh, beautifully. Yeah. Okay, so and then did you, you went out fairly quickly for live shows, right? Once you joined, oh, ten days. 10 days uh 10 days yeah 10 days to uh to learn the whole production you know the whole show and it's yeah. not like you know like if you somebody calls you up today and go hey listen there's a the, i'm doing an aussie show you're familiar with the music mm -hmm. it's part of your soundtrack right i'm talking about when you know we were doing songs from Diary of a Madman, and Diary of a Madman was still being mixed at the time oh, geez. It yeah. was there, so you've finished. never heard it, these songs no yeah. No, it was wow. it wasn't even on the radio. It was like, you know, so I had to like crash course to familiarize myself and learn them, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and internalize it, mm -hmm. you know. So it was like, okay, you know, this is it, and you know, so it's it. I I, I just jump jump right into it, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And when you headed out on tour, did you know the songs fairly well, or did you get through them? <laughs> Which one, the. Uh... The, the first time Which, when you guys went out after you learned these songs. Oh, like said, I mean, I, I, I was prepared by the time we, the best we you did could the in 10 days, show. right? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no. I, I, yeah, there was no room for mistakes. Mm -hmm. Pretty, they were yeah. pretty tight on it. Well, Ozzy. it's, 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 it's not even because of him. It's because of me. I, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't going to go out in front of 10,000 people and, I'm blowing it, it up. You know? Yeah. No, right. You don't no. want to do that. No. Have you ever done that? No. <laughs> okay, no. That's good. I, you never no. know, right? No, things no, happen. You, you, you never know. No. Nope. <laughs> okay. I well, mean, there, 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 there's a level, and you always you know that you can always be better mm -hmm. because you can only practice so much. I mean, you first first of all, you cannot rehearse adrenaline. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can you, you can spend a month working on the songs on your sofa, listening to it with headphones. As soon as you hit that stage, it's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. Now you got adrenaline rushing, and you got to perform the song, and you got the audience going crazy, and and the band, and and it's it's just it's a whole it's completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 we don't get spring training like like athletes do. We we get every night is the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. You go straight to the Super Bowl, the first show, yeah. bam, that's it. Yeah, right. And then while you were with Ozzy, is when you ended up going to record with Quiet Riot again, too, right? Yeah, well, that, that, no, well, yes, yes, but it, that was no intention to do both. Uh, uh, after Randy passed away, you know, I lost my. Uh, my family, mm. family, you know, Choir Riot has was my first, my my family, my and and to really have a family feeling in a band, it has to be a belief system, a consciousness that is shared by everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, the the type of music, what where do you want the band to go to, what level you know to the very top you know some you know and all of that and then everybody shared that that dream mm -hmm. you know that goal musical goal or you know whatever you want to call it and that's a family and 
we had that with uh, with Quiet Riot or w- w- with Randy. And then when Randy left the band, that that broke up the family, you know. And then when Randy, uh, when I started playing with Randy again in Ozzy, I got that back, that piece, mm. that 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 Quiet Riot consciousness. I mean, we were doing. <laughs> put it this way: if you look at like photos of like the first tour, the Blizzard of Oz tour, I mean. What I'm wearing had nothing to do with, with English heavy metal. First of all, I had never been to England before. All my references had to do with the Sunset Strip. That's it, right? So the way I was dressing, even Randy. Randy on the first tour that, that he did with Ozzy before I joined the band, he was wearing the polka dot vests. Right. He was like dressed like he did in Quiet Riot, but without the bow tie. Took that you off. Know? Yeah, he took that off. Then little by little, you know, he started like shopping in London, getting more of the local, you know, that look that everybody was sharing as far as the genre of music. You know, a tougher, more leather, Mm -hmm. more black, you know. But I hadn't been to England yet. So when I first joined the band, Sharon said, here's some money, go get some uh, stage clothes. I had to go to Melrose, Melrose Avenue in 1981 and there was nothing metal nothing no zero it was all new wave clothing or new wave and i'm going like wow you know i yeah i'm not gonna go up there and look like something out of a devo (laughs) you know up on stage with ozzy you know so so i i came up with this with this uh outfit and and nobody was happy with it because it was not metal (laughs) enough you know You know, say, and you know, like, let's say we have Motorhead opening up for us. Right. That's metal. Right. You know, and again, there was a consciousness. It's like the guys in the band and the crew dress alike and everybody wore either a vest or a jean jacket with Motorhead patches. Right. And Motorhead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it took me about a week to figure out who was in the band and who was in the crew because (laughs) everybody looked alike. Mm-hmm. See, we never had that in L.A. Right. You know, right. In, in L.A., it was like you dress a certain way when you go on the stage and then you still dress metal, but you got to leave it a little bit of room for something special Yeah. when you go on stage. Yeah, that was part uh, of it. That was part of it, yeah. With Motorhead, it was like, no, it was all, you know, while you were on stage, you were in the bus, tour bus. When you go to the, to the truck stop, in the middle of Nebraska, you're going to wear the same thing. You know what I mean? So it was mm-hmm. like a continuous, again, consciousness, you mm-hmm. know? And the fan base looked like that too. Yeah. That's like the the real, you know, that new wave of metal that came from the late 70s and early 80s into the United States. That, that That's the way it was. It was kind of like, what happened was the fans started putting patches and treating bands like they were soccer teams. Like if you were into like one of their many soccer teams, you know, they have in England and Europe Mm -hmm. and you were, if you were a fan of that team, you wore the colors and you had Uh the, uh, all of the patches and everything, you know what I mean? So everybody knew what you belong to. Yeah. So with bands, fortunately with bands, they were into the genre of music rather than one band. Of course, they would probably have their favorite band, but then they have like, like bands that were relative genre wise mm. to their favorite bands. Okay. Okay. And then, so let me ask you this. So when Randy passed away, you guys were in Florida, right? I believe. Is that where that happened? Kissimmee. Yeah. March. It's going to be 40 years uh, next month, uh, March 19th. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, after that happened, I mean, you guys almost stopped, correct? Well, we, we, we had to take a few days off for, to find a, uh, a guitar player to carry on, to continue. And, uh, but we knew we couldn't stop, you know. Mm. We knew that if Ozzy went home, he would have drank himself to death or Wouldn't been good, you know, somehow man. it would have not been a good turn. To. So it was a matter of just keep him busy, just keep him going forward. Don't, mm-hmm. don't let him be alone, you know. Yeah. For yeah. long lengths of time, you know, and let's keep them occupied, you know, I, I you know, so, yeah. so we did, but, but it was incredibly tough, 
I got to tell you, it's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, how did you yeah. handle that yourself? Well, how I handled that is uh, I, I disconnected myself from from the music. I, I lost the joy of playing. It was like I'm just playing notes here. I'm surviving. We we're in mm. survivor survival mode completely. I see. Completely. That's all we did. We just survived the shows, you know. Uh, and so you know, a so let's say in the summer. A few months after Randy had passed away, I get a call from Kevin Dubrow to come in and record a song that wound up on the Metal Health record called uh, Thunderbird yep. that he wrote originally when Randy left the band. And now he changed the lyrics a little bit more to fit him, him having passed. And uh, so he asked me to uh, come in and just record one song for the uh, for a tentative possible record because <laughs> they haven't signed the record deal yet or anything and uh, they were just actually they were just making demos that the demos turn into masters you know mm -hmm. and uh, so I go in the studio and there's Frankie playing drums who by then this is uh, 40 years ago this year by then I have been playing with him on and off for 10 years so here's part of my family here yeah then then there's kevin who i've been playing with him in quiet riot and living with him quiet riot and dubrow playing with him uh, living with him and that uh, so there's another part of my family and it just it just it just felt like being home again was it mm -hmm. you know yeah I, I at the time the band wasn't was not even called it wasn't even called it was called, called dubrow quiet mm -hmm. riot did not do another <laughs> show I asked Quiet Riot until the weekend of March 19th, the you know, in 2019, 1983, 1983. That was, so it stopped in 79, then in 83, that's, what, that's when it becomes again, Quiet Riot. As a live performing band, we signed the record deal as Quiet Riot prior to that. Yeah, I believe it was in either late October or November of 1982. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you so, recorded Thunderbird, and then that ended up to, led to the rest of the songs, correct? You playing on the rest of the songs? Yeah. So, so what happens with the exception of two songs of that uh, that Carlos Cabasso brought in from his band Snow? Uh, one of them was uh, "Don't Wanna Let You Go," and the other one was. Originally titled "No More Booze," right? Metal which health. became which became Metal Health. Yeah, you know, and uh, the uh, those two songs Chuck Wright plays bass on. Okay. And then actually, once I went into just playing one song, I have no idea what his status was in the band because uh, they asked me. So 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 we do Thunderbird. And we do it like rather quickly because I, I used to play that song in, in Dubrow. Mm -hmm. So I knew, you know, I knew how to play the bass. I came up with a, with a bass part for that. And then they asked me, well, you know, we got, we got a lot of time left here. The session where you remember like Slick Black Cadillac. And I go, yeah, just let's run it through one time and we'll cut it. So we did Slick Black, uh, Slick Black Cadillac and a couple of other songs from Dubrow. And so by the time I left the session, I had recorded like four, uh, four definitely four, maybe even five songs. Wow. And, and it felt like, wow, I, I don't know what the future holds for this band, but it felt like, you know, I, it brought back the joy of playing for me, yeah. you know, to be playing with, with, with my family again. Carlos, I, I did not know very well because I hadn't been in a band in a band with him, and I we were not really, I you know I think we did a couple of shows with Snow his band, mm -hmm. but we weren't you know we weren't like socializing or anything, and so I I, I happened to meet him basically okay. at that, on that on that session. Yeah. So so after I was done with the session, Carlos's brother comes in. To, uh, to to lay down the bass for come on feel the noise and 
And that's when I hear Frankie and Carlos, uh, I mean, and Frankie and Kevin trying to come up with how we're going to sabotage the recording of this song because we really don't want it to right. be, we really don't want to do the song for a record. Yeah, I yeah. heard that. I heard they didn't want that yeah. song. So they didn't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, they didn't, they, they didn't want to do it. I mean, we, then once I joined the band, because after I'm done with that session, I went back on the road with Ozzy and I recorded the Speak of the Devil, the Black Sabbath mm -hmm. recordings with mm -hmm. Ozzy. And uh, so during, during that, we had like five days of rehearsal and then we did uh, two nights at the Ridge. So I was gone for about maybe a week to 10 days. And during that time, it was just like, yeah, it lingering about going back with Quiet Riot. And, you know, even though there was no guarantees about anything. So mm -hmm. here I am, I leave one, one of the biggest bands in the world. Right. For the complete unknown, but I knew I was going to be happy. Which yeah, is yeah. What really, really, really matter with me. You know. So, so you left Ozzy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Right, right. 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 After I was done with recording, uh, uh, "Speak of the Devil." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what did you tell him? You just said, "I'm going back." Yeah. Basically, phone yeah. call to <laughs> yeah, Sharon. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, even though I did offer to to finish off the some of the upcoming tour dates that they had, and she just hang up with me. <laughs> Which oh, is okay, I, I get it. I get it. I yeah, get it. but look okay. what you got into, right? Look, if you didn't make that move, you might have never had the quiet riot that we had. Oh, I mean, no. If I would never made that move, I would probably would have never found the joy of playing again. Mm -hmm yeah okay that's that's the way I, that's the way i look at it yeah yeah you're right um so you guys go did you re-record all the songs for metal health or did you use those songs no. that you had already recorded that that was it yeah oh, the okay. demos demos turn into into masters yeah okay. i mean you know it, when, when you say demo it's because there's no record deal so you can you have to call it something oh well, these are demos because we're gonna demonstrate what the band and the music sounds like so right. after so so it's up to the record company to say well we like the quality of what i hear let's keep let's keep these you don't have to go in the studio again to re-record these these are done and that was it yeah. and then they liked come on feel the noise right and that's what got you guys the record signed? company yeah yes yeah well so that kind of backfired in a good way of you oh, guys yeah. trying to play it bad happy accidents <laughs> uh what actually happened is that the producer spencer proffer he was looking for a band basically a singer that could actually sing that song because he felt that that song would be a huge hit in america mm -hmm. uh at that time so he found that that singer to be kevin debro and he was absolutely right you know yeah i think kevin is such an amazing singer i don't Absolutely. think he got enough credit back in those days as he deserved yeah yeah i know i know um yeah yeah he should have gotten way more credit you know yeah i mean he in my opinion he was one of the best at of that era oh i would say from all the guys that came out of the sunset strip he is my my, my favorite yeah. absolutely yeah absolutely yeah yeah so you guys came out with um the metal health album right at the kind of a perfect storm with mtv and everything else right mtv wow without mtv we wouldn't even have the 80s <laughs> you're right you're right <laughs> yeah, about yeah. It that way. yeah. But, but i mean you guys so i remember you guys all over mtv yeah night and day it, you guys yeah. and twisted sister yeah well before twisted uh, made their splash on mtv uh, you could actually set the watch Every, on every half hour, come and feel the noise. Would That's be amazing. would air on MTV. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you guys were out on tour supporting that album, getting bigger and bigger. Oh right? God, yeah, yeah. We toured so hard. Oh my God. Uh, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of things fell into place. One of them is that uh, we had just signed with an agency out of Detroit who happened to to uh, represent uh, Scorpions. So the Scorpions were getting ready, warming up, mini tour, mini, uh, maybe two and a half weeks. 
uh, from Duluth all the way down to Denver. And we were the opening band. So by the time we got to Denver, the last show we were going to do with the Scorpions, the promoter uh, for the US Festival saw us play, open up for the Scorpions, comes into our dressing room right after they finish our show and introduce himself. He goes, hi, my name is Barry Fay. I am not only the promoter here for this show, but I'm also putting, I am the promoter for the US Festival. And we just happened to move one of the bands from the metal day to the following day. So we have an opening, which you guys like to do the US Festival. To be honest wow. with you, I have no, I had no idea what he was talking about, right. but, but our manager did. And he says, yeah, 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 let's talk. So they talked, they talked it over, figure it out, figure it out mainly because we had to like move some things, uh, you know, our schedule. We mm -hmm. were going to be playing. And also we had to fly the day before we had a show in El Paso outdoors and in, in the afternoon, we caught a flight to, to LAX, drive to San Bernardino, you know, check in late at night, wake up early in the morning the next day, our equipment, we didn't have access to our equipment. Our equipment was going to the following gig after the Els Festival. So everything was rented and we could get stuff from SIR because they already allocated the equipment to all the other bands. Yeah, it was there a were big like show. 40, maybe 40 bands playing, yeah. you know, uh, during that weekend. You know, and it was like, uh, you know, we had to like borrow equipment from our friends and I had to, there was some backline company. Actually, my, my backline did not work at the US Festival. So all those amplifiers behind me on stage, they were, not, they, nothing, no, no, no waves were coming out of them. On stage, uh, oh, wow. Fortunately, yeah, fortunately, the, uh, the sound company was the same company that did the sound for Ozzy. So I knew all the guys. And they helped me out and pumped my bass through huge monitor system. Mm. I mean, this is a huge stage with yeah. huge side fills, and but but it didn't sound like 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 it would from an amplifier. It just sounded like very clean. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, but but it worked. Man, so, that was that know, was a big show. Yeah, it's it's a big show, but you know we we, we had so many technical difficulties, like Frankie's. Uh, drum tech which will happen to be a friend of his that he called up to do a favor to be his drum tech uh at the house festival he's on stage on the drum riser looks out in the audience sees about three hundred fifty thousand people and has a heart attack what <laughs> right on what? the drum riser frankie has to like go on stay on the drum riser and set up his drum kit while this guy is being you know the oh MCs the are you know taking care of it yeah yeah. Oh so, man. You know, all, all these little things. I yeah. mean, I could go into I could spend like an hour talking about the little things that went wrong. But at the end of the day, we just went there and and just, you know, do a typical choir ride show. Choir ride was basically the same band where the, we played in a club or we play at the US Festival. Just go right. out there and kick ass. Right. And they were that way when you first saw them, you're saying. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. They were a bigger band. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, if, if you if you look at like photos of, of early Randy Rhodes playing in little clubs, I mean, I'm talking about the clubs where you stand on stage and the ceiling is hitting your head, and we're not really that. And tall, you're next you to know. the bathroom. Yeah, we're ne next. To, we, we are in the bathroom, <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know. And then you see Randy playing with Ozzy. It's it's the same guy. Yeah. It's the same passion and energy and and and, and power. You know. Yeah. 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 When you're playing, you know, you've always had that that showmanship thing about you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with your playing. Have you always had that or is that something you just developed along the way? Well, once I found my home, again, with Quiet Riot, I would say that that was because, you know, when you're in, in a band that you're, is your band, just mm -hmm. like everybody else's, you'll, you'll share the band, you know. We all leave each other alone. I mean, of, of course, people come up with ideas and influences, but you're not really being put it this way. You're not, you're not tied mm -hmm. to certain to certain conformity. Sure, you have to conform to that band the way it is. Right. You know. So, with very few exceptions, uh, 
I have I very few exceptions. I've always had to adapt myself to a situation and bring a little bit of choir riot with me, just enough to conform to the format of what the band is all about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With well, one you, exception, I, I would say White Snake. Because, I was going to say because you brought that yeah. over into White Snake too. Yeah, uh, but then again, David uh, White Snake had been touring with Choir Riot in '84. They, he would see me every single night. He, so he knew, knew what, what he was, was getting. At. Yeah, he knew what he was getting himself into. And, and I did ask him before we went on tour, how do you want me to be on stage? And he says, be yourself. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Because I knew. He knew what I was all about. So it was like, okay, so that means that there's going to be a lot of other people with the same freedom on stage. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. That's awesome. How did you start licking your bass? <laughs> Just, I'll tell just... you the story. <laughs> yeah, very simple. Uh, we were doing the video for Here I Go Again. And, you know, every director has their own style of doing things. Uh, this director, Marty Colner, when he worked with us, he would leave the close-ups towards the end of the shoot. And we're talking about, you know, 10, 12-hour plus shoot. So by the time... I was doing my my close-ups. See, and this is this is what, what the big difference was. The next day we had to come back and do the video is this love. So oh, I wasn't okay. like, okay, this is gonna run long, but I have the next day to sleep in. No. No. I knew I had to like go home, get like maybe four or five hours tops of sleep, come right back. And mm-hmm. do a video. And you want to be fresh. You want to be, you know, you don't want to look, look tired. You don't want to look tired. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course. So, okay. So I do, so we're doing the close-ups and he goes, okay, uh, action. And I started playing and I'm tired by then. I'm just kind of like phoning it in. And he knows it. You know, he's, a, he's an incredible director. He knows. He knows how to get the best out of you, right? So he goes, uh, you know, so the uh, the song ends and he goes to me. Is that the best you got? And I said, you know what? This 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 is too big for me to to fail right here. And I asked him and said, yeah, please give me one more take. So two things. I needed to deliver my best and I needed to get out of there. So what I did is I did every every move I could think of. Whatever came to mind. Everything. No, not whatever. Everything that came to my mind. The weirdest things I had never done before, right? because I just needed to give him something and needed to get it done right there because I wanted to go home and and come back the next day, right? So, so you know, one of them was just licking the base, right? <laughs> one of and and so you know, a few weeks later, I see the cut, the edit, and I see me licking the base, and I go, "Wow, that's great." It could have been worse. I was doing worse stuff <laughs> oh, geez. In, on the on camera than that. And I'm going, well, that's not too bad. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> and then and you had to keep it in there, right? Yeah, I keep it in there. No, it's, it's a video. Yeah, yeah. It's, sub, it's subliminal. People think that, that I, do, I do that all the time. No, I don't. But you yeah. do it live too, right? No? Nah. No? What? Oh, okay. What's the point? What's the I point? I don't know. Just fun. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no because it, it, it was there was other stuff just because it wound up in a video doesn't mean that i gotta do it every single night you know yeah I, no i know i know i know, you know i grew you know. up I, I play bass myself and i grew up watching you oh. and i remember watching watching that for some reason that stuck with yeah you. yeah, yeah. Know, when you did that yeah you have to remember you know there are certain things that are natural to me because they happen to have an origin one of them is licking, licking my fingers. I got that from play, uh, playing in Florida, playing in clubs, coming home at five, six o'clock in the morning because they, they have late, late, mm-hmm. late hours in Miami. You know, sometimes we won't even start until like midnight and do six sets and then, and then, you, and then you get home. Uh, and then I would leave. I was too tired to take the bass out of the trunk and just leave it there in the trunk. And I'm talking in the days that I was using flat wounds <clears throat> because it was that long ago, 69, <laughs> 70. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 
So by the time that I would, the next night after sitting there in the humidity and 120 degrees, I would go take the bass out of the, when I, once I got to the club, out of my trunk, walk in, take it out to tune it. And it's got moss and it's all rusty and, uh. and go wipe it off a little bit, but still it was like dead. So I started licking it just so I got something yeah to play some grease to play with right you know because it was because it, they were rusty moldy strings you know <laughs> and that's how i i developed that I from see. doing that yeah so that became a habit it became a habit kind of like i'm kind of like between every song i have to retune even though i it doesn't sound like it's out of tune it's you just, just have it's, to it's just like i have to you know so i'm licking my fingers when i play i have to you know something that that it's a almost like a psychosis you know that i developed wow yeah yeah okay so back to um quiet riot now you you did the mental health and they pulled you off the road early to make condition critical right yeah they did what? they did you because know, I, we i, I we, hear we that just a lot started... i'm yeah. sorry i hear that no, a lot no. with with artists that i speak to on the show that mm -hmm. they get pulled off the road as they're kind of peaking or as the momentum's going well there's two momentums there's the there's the album momentum Mm -hmm. And then there's the touring momentum. And this is where they go off sync. Uh, an album starts picking up because you're touring. It starts picking up when you're an opening band. Then it, once it peaks, when it reaches the heights, let's say number one in our case, mm -hmm. that's when you start headlining. So now you've got another momentum as a headliner. But as, as, as that album, you're headlining it, it's the record sales are beginning to dwindle because the album has been out for a year now. And I don't I care see. who you are. After a year, there's a decline. And the record company looks at like, okay, your record came out a year ago and we're looking at the third quarter of this year for you to release the next one. I see. Because, yeah, because you're you're touring during the first and second, the third, which is uh, leads up to August, August, September, September will be the last month that you can actually release that record on the third quarter, mm. fourth quarter, it's all dedicated to greatest hits, especially back in the day, mm. Christmas records, Christmas records and greatest hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, uh, you know, grandma goes to the record store and wants to get her grandson or granddaughter sure. a record and they look at the greatest hits of elton john right that's the one that's it you know yeah. mm -hmm. or a christmas record from the carpenters or whatever yeah. you know you yeah, know that, that yeah, makes total sense board, you know yeah mm -hmm. so that third quarter is your last chance to, to make a record to release the record so which also they feel well it's going to carry over until christmas so if you release in july august that carries over right into Christmas sales. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they pull you off the road with pretty yeah. much no warning, right? They just say, hey, we're going back, make a record. Is that how it happens? There was no memo. There was our producer and record company, Pasha Records, uh, Spencer came on the road. We we're playing some, I believe it was in Arizona because I'm looking at the hotel look like an Adobe. Uh, it was either Texas, Arizona, somewhere like that in the uh, in the southwest of the United States, and we have a meeting. He didn't say anything before that. At the meeting, he says, "Listen, this, here's the situation. We got to do this. We got to get it done. We got to pull you guys off the road." And and we understood because we had a commitment to to the label. You can't you can't tell the label how to run their business. Right, they're in the business of, of selling records, and 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 your your lifeline as a as a band depends on them, and you being on the same team, not working against each other. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that can hurt a band's second record? Okay, th this is what usually happens. Your first record, you spend your entire right. life writing music for that. Right, second record, so you got the best off you have on that record, maybe a cover or two, right? Because the record company wants insurance. Okay, so the next record, if you're successful, like it happened to Quiet Riot, 
you're on the road for about a year and a half. And especially 40 years ago, with we didn't have the technology of iPhones to actually start recording ideas backstage or mm -hmm. in your dressing room or in your hotel or in the back lounge. You know, now you can basically, you know, make demos and work on, on the next record while you're right. on tour, you know, or sound check, you know, get this idea, which flesh it out. Not back then. It was impossible. I mean, if you had anything, it was that this little dictation recorders you mm. know from radio shack uh now now there's so much technology that you could actually prepare yourself and keep writing while you're on the road you mm -hmm. know be mm -hmm. uh be uh be creative while you're still touring mm -hmm. so it's 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 a bit different nowadays yeah so after the second record is when you were done with the band right <clears throat> yes okay yeah. and what yeah. what led to that what Oh, they, it was it was just a situation that uh, personally, uh, for whatever reason, it just became toxic for me. Mm. I, uh, I I wasn't happy, people wise, you know. And then again, you know, this happened oh, maybe thirty five years ago. Yeah, thirty, you know, a while ago. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with things the way that I know how to deal with things now. Sure, you know, I did different. not know. Uh, I was different. So was everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we didn't, we lost dialogue. Mm. I mean, I, I still look at photos from that, from that tour and I go, I can't, I can't believe that. It looks like we there's so much chemistry on stage still, but we aren't even talking to each other. You know, it was, it was, it was kind of like, I, I, I kind of like question myself what, of, Right. Was I really leaving the band? Yes, I left. It. Yeah, everybody knew that. I, I they knew I was leaving the band before we we started the tour. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah. you just felt that commitment to go ahead and do oh, the I tour? had to. I yeah. had to. I, I, yeah, I, I had to keep my integrity. Mm. I can't just walk away from contracts being signed or sure or anything like. I, I, I left the band. The way I came in, I didn't ask for any settlement, nothing. All I wanted to do is just cut, just be done. yeah, cut okay. our ties, and that was it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then you went on and did a few other projects before your next big project was White Snake, right? Yeah. And those projects that I did before was because we we thought these were deep deep projects. Hmm. You know. Um, uh, one of them, especially being the uh, the driver record with Tony McAlpine, Tommy Aldridge, and, and Bob Rock. Mm -hmm. Rob, Rob, Rob Rock, Rob Rock. Yeah. Is that is that where you first met Tommy? Oh no, I played with Tommy oh, in, in Aussie. Yes, yeah. you did. Yes, you did. Yeah. I, that's my yeah. And okay, I got so photos you... to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe you because I've seen them. <laughs> uh, so so you're with Tommy in there, and then how did you both end up in White Snake? Uh, because uh, when I left Quiet Riot in 85, Ozzy, uh, Tommy left Ozzy in 85, and we started working together. Put it, put it, so we have been together all that time. As a matter yeah. of fact, we, in 85, uh, we got a call from White Snake Management to come to their office, and they offer us to join the band. And uh, I have been on tour with them. I, I knew I understood the dynamics and the frictions, the friction the that was going on within the band from being around them and hanging with them. So I just thought, you know, Joan Sykes is incredibly talented. He's a star, but I know he's not, he doesn't get along with, uh, with, with David. There was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they made such an incredible record. I can't believe that, that all the, friction that was a surrounding that record they still made a phenomenal record 1987 record yes you know so so i i, I declined because i just didn't want to go from having left one situation and join another one you know mm -hmm. so so uh, tommy and i would just you know continue doing what we were doing and then a couple of years later we get another call and this time from Coladner, the, uh, the record was done and they were getting ready to shoot the videos. And uh, so that's when 
Tommy and I, you know, and by then we knew that Sykes was, so it was only David left and I'm going, okay. At the time I you joined. It, yeah. The time that okay. I joined uh, yeah, from that previous incarnation of White Snake, David was the only person left because when White Snake opened up for Quiet Riot, it was Cozy Powell on mm. drums and then Cozy left and Ainsley Dunbar did the 90, 1987 record along with mm. Neil Murray and, uh, and John Sykes. And uh, so by the time the record was done, it was just David left. I see. I see. Yeah. So then you guys ended up putting, I guess, like a, a super group together with Vivian and Adrian. Well, it was super as far as not only musically, but us getting along. I mean, there was so much collective consciousness at the time in that band. Everybody... It felt like a family. It really mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bunch of so people it just in the tour clicked bus. right away. Yeah, it just, it just clicked immediately. Yeah, That's on awesome. stage, off stage, it, it was great. Yeah, you know, a story with uh, when I was a kid with White Snake, I went to see Motley Crue on the Girls Girls mm -hmm. Girls tour, and you guys yeah. were on the um, supposed to be opening for Motley on that tour. What city was that? What it city? was in Florida, Lakeland and Fort Myers. Oh. So that's so okay. I heard you, you guys were supposed to be opening that tour. And then when I bought my ticket, you guys weren't on the ticket stub, but it was Guns N' oh, Roses was, was opening. Guns N' Roses, yeah. 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 And I yeah. was so mad because yeah. I hadn't at that time, I had no idea who Guns yeah. N' Roses were. They, yeah. they haven't, yeah. they didn't do anything yet. Yeah. And I was mad that yeah. White Snake wasn't opening, but it ended yeah. up Guns N' Roses taking the spot. Yeah. How much, how much was the ticket? I think it was. I don't know. I still have the ticket stuff. I'm going to have to look. It might have been like 1950 or something like that. Yeah. I think you got your money's worth. <laughs> I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> I got pictures too. I was back far, but I, back then I used to put the, because we had the film cameras, you know, the, the bricks. I used to wear I my remember, big tall yeah. Reebok and I'd put it on the bottom of my shoe, put my shoe on oh, and then walk in. But yes, right. But then when yeah. you're taking the pictures, you know, I look at them now, you're like yeah. this big. But yeah, it was fun times. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I, it's it's. I can always tell how old a fan is when they, when they send me social media posts or messages about, about their perception that, in their story, there's there's a vault filled with Randy Rhodes footage, that that the Osbournes are keeping it from from everybody from mm -hmm. watching it. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, you must be like at least, you know, 15, 19. You, you must be from the iPhone generation thinking that our whole lives have been cataloged with our, you know, smartphone. You know? Right. Uh, it was like, like uh, there's a magazine doing a, uh, a tribute to Randy for March. And they asked me for some photos of me and Randy. Now, when they ask you for photos, it means like, we're not going to pay anybody for this. So it's got to be from your own collection that you took. Yeah. Meaning me, right? And I'm thinking, how old are these people? I mean, I know this magazine has been around, but I do know that it, people go in and out of magazines. So again, this person thinks that, I have my iPhone and I'm taking a picture of Randy and me playing on stage while we're on stage because <laughs> how else can I, can I take a picture? Yeah. Have yeah. it be my property. As you're doing a selfie. I, yeah. Doing a selfie of us playing on stage or hanging backstage. No, there was no selfies back then. Right. If, if, if I have a picture, it's a picture that I took of Randy or Ozzy or anybody else. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. So it, it, it happens everywhere. Yeah. People people think that all this stuff exists and it's going, no, guys, it doesn't exist. No, it was a struggle if, to it, get it, photos back then. In a concert. Way, if, if, if any footage of Randy Rose existed, that it's being in, in a property of the Osbournes, why would they keep it from, you know, from putting it out there and make money from it? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. If there's such evil people that they're trying to keep that content from from the fans, if they're evil, they they must be money hungry too. Yeah, so it's like yeah. put it out there, make all that money that you think people are gonna make. You know that you, that they're gonna make. It's yeah. just a lot of times it just doesn't make any sense. 
why are they whole if if let's say hypothetically it did exist why are they holding on to it right what's you know it's 40 years you know right right because Let's, it doesn't um, it doesn't exist and i know that because i was there and every time that there was some footage taken of us for b-roll for a local news station they will let us know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they will tell us you know yeah so let's let's fast forward a little bit because I know we're, we're I don't want to cut into all your time here, but you're back in Quiet Riot now. Yes, I am. And then, you know, during Frankie's passing, it, that was a wish that he wanted, right? He wanted you back in the band. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you know, after having a 50 year friendship, playing together, being my my bandmate, and and you know the. The person that really mentored me in what it's like, you know, as far as being part of the rhythm section, I had no idea. I had no clue. What I was doing was just learning bass parts from records. I had no concept of what it was like, you know, to be a band member, mm -hmm. what the role of the bass is, you know, for a song, just the same way that the role of the guitar and the drums are. And he's, he's the one who mentored me in that. And he opened up my uh, my perception to all these different styles of music. He used to work at a record store in Florida, so he had a massive collection of imports, massive, you know, stuff that was not available in your local J.C. Penney's right record rack. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right. Which is where I got my records from. You know, <laughs> go to downtown Miami. Uh, and yeah, it was a two-sided record rack, one next to each other at an end cap <laughs> in, the, uh, in, in the boys' clothing department because it was for kids, you know, all these rock and roll I, I, records. I, you you know. know, I, I might vaguely remember that. I was, I'm a little younger than you are. I'm, you're probably about 15, 20 years older than me, I think. Yeah, but, I'm 71, but, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'm about 50. So, yeah. but I think I vaguely remember that, something like that. Yeah. In, in the yeah. stores yeah oh yeah and uh it was mostly greatest hits or if it's something brand new and this is something that i was aware of i would look at a record if it was a brand new band i would look at to see who produced it or the label and i trusted i trusted mm -hmm. the label i did right right so when he did he tell you that he wanted you back in the band or did that come after his passing that you found that out well we used to spend a lot of time together and then he called me one day to his house we we lived like 15 minutes from each other here and i went over and he told me the uh the prognosis that i just received that he had stage four cancer pancreatic cancer <clears throat> and uh after shortly after that that's when he started getting treatments multiple treatments he would get like double treatments he would get the other uh, chemo and then alternative treatments mm -hmm. and he would go on tour try to keep things going try to keep it positive and then covid happened mm -hmm. and this is covid without the vaccine you right. know right and the last couple of times that i saw him after that period we would text all the time and was when he, the last day he spent at home, he was in hospice, but at home, home, we had a nurse and he, uh, um, his wife, Regina calls me up and says, uh, you know, Frankie wants you to come over. And so I, I went over and held his hand <clears throat> for a few hours and he was in and out you know taking morphine and then the next day i get the call from his wife again she goes uh, we 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 took him to the hospital this morning and he's not gonna make it through the night so she arranged it for me to come in and this is uh kaiser which is a you know big big hospital chain of hospitals we have here in california mm -hmm. and covid pre-vaccine in a hospital and she arranged it for me to be able to walk in, to go go and spend the last hours with Frankie uh, at the hospital. 
and I, I'll, you know, I, I, I'm so grateful for Regina to be able to, uh, to do mm-hmm. that for me. And, um, uh, and he passed away that evening. Mm. Man. You know, you and I, we share that same kind of situation. Um, my drummer that was in my band for a long time, I knew known him since high school. He got diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer around the same time Frankie did a little bit afterwards. Mm. Mm. And I told him and he called me up. He said, look, it doesn't look good. This is what's going on. And then a couple months he was doing the treatment. And I told him, I said, you know, Frankie finale is fighting that same situation. Mm. So he reached out to Frankie Mm. and Frankie got back to him, wrote him back. Mm. I don't Mm. know what was said, but they communicated. And then when Frankie passed, he told me, he's like, this hit me hard. So I don't know what kind of friendship they built at that time, but, but Frankie, Frankie's passing hit him hard. Yeah. And then he ended up passing away a few months later. Mm-hmm. So sorry, sorry for your loss. Yeah. It's, really. that's, a, that's a tough thing. It's very tough, you know, because it's, it's that emotional roller coaster. And, and the first time I went through it was uh, with Ronnie James Dio. Mm. Uh, there was a point that we thought he's either in remission or close to remission. And bam, within a couple of days, he just, it just, yeah, he, he was within, within hours of passing, yeah. yeah, you know, and I had, you know, I, I, I went over the day before he passed away to the hospital and again, you know, held his hand and he was on the morphine and you know it just and that that yeah it's because you, you have such high hopes mm-hmm. that they're gonna make it you know everything's gonna be okay yeah and then yeah and then it's not it's just like that yeah that's what happened yeah. to to my my friend too i mean I, I talked to him like two days before he passed away and he's like yeah, yeah i feel good you know i think everything's going yeah. good and then boom yeah. But, yeah. But anyway, so back into Quiet Right. You're back in Quiet Right now. We'll pick up this. Yeah. Uh, we'll pick up this. Uh, get away from the sadness right now yeah. and talk about Quiet yeah. Right. Um, mm. Now you guys are out there kicking ass right now. Yeah, I. You know, I joined the band, and the guys have been doing it for a while with Frankie, except for of course Johnny Kelly, who previously uh, was in uh, Typo Negative and uh, and uh, Danzig, right. and. Uh, but you know Johnny have been playing it for a few months before I joined the band, so I'm I'm just trying to catch up not only with what, they, what they've been doing all along, but also with what I used to do, you know, and it's it's and then I'm trying to take it to the next level at the same time because I'm not I don't want to play the way I did 40 years ago. Come on, it's been 40 years. I'm a better bass player now than I was right. then. But then but then you got some parameters. You can I make it too jazzy or you know what i mean yeah yeah you know know, it's got to be you don't want to go too far off the path too far off yeah from what the original intent of 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 the music is but then again you know i i've grown as a musician so i don't want to be able to apply that and 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 everybody else you know the the same thing i i uh i have conversations with the guys because they're so talented and they're so so giving you know, they, they, everybody plays from their heart, and and we have one one collective mission. Our mission is to celebrate the legacy of the band, set the memory of Frankie and Kevin and and and, and Randy. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that, and that that's our mission. And our mission is also to have fun doing it because that's what Choir Riot is all about, yeah. and to uh, and to and you know to bring and, and then again. Let's say when, when we do a show like we just did at the Mohegan Sun Arena with Stephen Piercy playing, you know, all the hits from Rat and Slaughter, you know, it, I look at it and I go, you know, this is a celebration of a, of a consciousness. You know, I, I, I read so many messages of people saying, I miss the 80s. Well, the 80s is in your mind. Yeah. It's an experience. It's still there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
yeah if you if you really miss the 80s reconnect reconnect with what the 80s means to you in your story what's the 80s about that you really miss because it's still there yeah all of that and that's our goal to help everybody not only as ourselves as quiet right but also as, as a generation mm -hmm. i see a lot of great music uh these guys you know you know, like I mentioned, Slaughter and Stephen Piercy, you know, or even when he goes as himself or Rat, they go out there and they kick ass and they really give the audience what they came for. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, and, and, and we all go out there and do the same thing. And it's like, boom, there mm -hmm. you go. This is, it's a celebration. Mm -hmm. And you guys really sound is. great. I mean, Jizzy does a great job at it's singing those songs. Those yes. songs aren't easy to sing. They're not. There are very few people on the planet that can actually sing it. And Jizzy's one of them. But another thing about Jizzy, you know, his band, Love Hate, mm -hmm. they're from the Sunset Strip. Yep. They, we, we all drank from the same well. We all had the same consciousness. We all came from the same cradle, mm -hmm. the Sunset Strip. He understands you know? it. And yeah, so, you know, we, we have conversations. And and it's not like I have to tell him anything because he was there. Right. I don't have to explain it to him. Right. You know, like I'm talking to like somebody who like, oh, I, I read it in a magazine, blah, blah, blah. No, no. The guy was there. He was making music already. Yeah. He was playing yeah. around town. You know, uh, Johnny Kelly, the same thing with a typo negative. You know, there's a guy that was one of the, in one of the top bands of, of that genre of music, you know, very unique band. He gets it. Yeah. And he understands about loss too, losing Peter Steele, mm -hmm. you know, a bandmate, your family. He understands it. Mm -hmm. So these are people that I know I go on stage and we all we all have that collective consciousness of why are we here? Alex Grossi, he was picked by Kevin. He's mm -hmm. been he's the he's the third guitar player in Choir Riot. Yeah, he's been and there he's a been long there, time. He's been there almost 20 years. Yeah. You know. And Frankie uh, mentored him in taking care of, of all things Choir Riot. Mm -hmm. So That's basically, fantastic. not only is he a guitar player, but he's also our, our you know, he come, you know, he, he's uh, Regina, his wife, Frankie's wife. It's, uh, you know, she's managing the band and, and Alex works with her managing the band. You know, are you going to record a new album with this lineup? Oh boy, we got so many songs right now, and I'm really, really excited. Uh, we have to look at our schedule. We're going to start working on it in uh, in the summertime. Mm -hmm. We got a few a few tracks already done, uh, and then we're just looking at what else uh, we need to add to it. Nice. You know? Yeah, so it's uh, I'm I'm very very excited. Um, a lot of the tracks have Frankie playing on it. As a matter of fact, we have one with uh, with kevin singing wow really yeah yeah wow, and, and fantastic. it's fantastic every time i hear it i get chills because it's a, I bet. A, actually it's 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 turning into my favorite choir riot song that i've ever recorded with the band wow you know um there's a certain organic element about it mm -hmm. but uh but the way that it was actually came about is really it's really unique Hmm. Yeah. Okay. When you're doing, um, you play <coughs> Thunderbird live. Does that take on a whole different oh, sure. meaning for you now? I mean, it's got to be very emotional for you. It is very emotional. Uh huh. It is uh, extremely emotional, and it, and I mean, I've done like by now, let's see, six shows with the band, and it, and that emotional factor, it will never go away. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good, man. I'm, 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 I'm glad to see you out there still doing it, Rudy. Like I said, I, I grew up a bass player uh, following you since I was a kid. I had your uh, instructional VHS tape. Oh, wow. was it like, was it stars or what was the name of that? It was yeah, stars. Was Hot it stars? Licks. Stars. Yeah, Hot Hot Licks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hot Licks, yeah. I don't know what happened to that tape, but I wish well, I still it's, had it. It's, it's on YouTube for free. So <laughs> <laughs> just go and watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I can look at that, 
and go, wow, I, I, I cannot even, I mean, I look at it and I'm kind of like as a, as a uh, experiencing it rather than reliving it uh -huh. because I'm such a different player uh, conceptually. Per my perception uh, of, of music is completely different today than it was back then. I see. Do you teach at all with online and everything? Yeah, I, you know, I, I teach at a place called, uh, we do rock and roll fantasy camps mm -hmm. because it's one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I find it that teaching, teaching, teaching meaning that I have somebody on the other end like you mm -hmm. and I have to hear what they're playing and I have to show them what needs to be fixed. It's a barrier. Uh -huh. it's, it's physically, it's a barrier. I'm not in the same room. I rather teach. I, I must teach in the same room because right. there's so much of a of a physical, physical, especially with an instrument, mm -hmm. physicality having to do. How do you how you holding it yourself, finger position? You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. All of that. Mm -hmm. The mechanics, the mechanics mm -hmm. of playing an instrument. Uh, yeah. So I, I I tried it and I I, I was not satisfied with my with my uh, contribution. So I so I stopped doing them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, before we go, tell me about, um, you're still doing your radio show. Oh yeah. Monster and you, Star Rock Radio. And you had a podcast too, right? Well, I had the podcast that let that turn into the radio show. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. And on your yeah. radio show, is it, I've never heard it. It's on Monsters yeah. of Rock Radio. Yeah. I, yeah. What we do is like, uh, it's like a traditional radio. It's a broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday. Uh, broadcast and then after a few bro uh, rebroadcasts of the same episode it will go up to spotify so if you really want to catch anything uh go to spotify monsters of rock okay and you'll see you see like a, a lineup of my of my shows that you can um uh, you know stream yeah and listen to it uh, i really recommend like the ones with frankie benali or even my brother or Greg Gillis, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, people okay. that I really, you know, spent a lot of time with. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check those out. Now, your brother, Robert, was in Hurricane. Yes. Right. And did, wasn't he? Oh, he still is. He still is. Yeah, yeah he still he's, is. He's, 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 yeah, yeah. But let's rewind like real quick. I know I keep saying I got to get going here because we're, we're going time. I hope you're OK, but I'm going to end this here yeah. soon. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, okay. But but he wasn't he chosen to fill in for Randy? At yeah, at one point, this is before uh, there was a lot of chaos going on, and nobody uh, realized that that Bernie Torme had been sent from England already right. with the gig. He had been paid in advance, right. and all of that. Yeah, he was. So, they chose him. Like Ozzy didn't choose choose him. That somebody else chose it, right? Yeah, the office. Well, mm -hmm. oh, you need a guitar player. Whoa. We got this guy. Okay, you go. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. He, nobody said, you know, I mean, this is 40 years ago. Yeah. It's a lot of chaos going on. I'm, I, total chaos. <laughs> so nobody was informed about that this guy that just arrived, he's got the gig. So yeah, start rehearsing yeah. with him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I thought I heard something about that. I just wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, listen, Rudy, I appreciate your time. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your show. Look forward to it. Yeah, man.